Um, so I'm going to talk about deep goal parameterized reinforcement learning. So a bit of the discussion on the last presentation was on hindsight experience replay. I'm going to talk about it also in more detail. So for those uh, who have questions, it will be uh, the occasion to, uh, to ask me because I'm supposed to understand quite well these papers. So um, uh, I will present a first a bit of background on what I'm doing during the thesis. I'm in the middle of my thesis actually. I will present a bit what I'm doing and why um, I got interested in, uh, goals, in goal spaces. Uh, then a bit about the algorithms that I use, mainly GDPG as presented by Olivier yesterday. And then the results and environments on which I perform uh, experiences and uh, experiments. And finally, a bit of future work and mainly open questions to discuss with you. So, um, my position, my the, the, the thesis, I'm uh, what I'm working on is what I call supervised autonomy, supervised autonomous exploration. The idea is that uh, I would like to have an agent to be able to simultaneously discover and learn tasks alone, so that's the autonomous exploration part, uh, like on the, on the rightmost image. And at the same time, I would like this agent to be able to integrate teaching signals from a caregiver, for example, a bit like uh, an infant does when playing with a human, for example. So uh, this objective requires two, uh, two mechanisms, an interaction mechanism and, an, uh, and a learning mechanism. For the interaction, we wish to take inspiration from infants. Uh, the idea is that instead of using high level social signals like language, uh, which I think is a bad idea for now in the state of the, de well, the, the state of the development of this uh, of natural language processing, for example. I don't think language is the right way to go for now. Instead of this, what I'd like to do is use low-level social signals, uh, like pointing gestures from humans, like gaze dynamics, and so on. And for this, we take inf inspiration from infants, who, well, children are clearly able to use uh, this kind of low-level social signals very efficiently uh, to understand the intentions of a caregiver, to understand uh, what to attend to, and so on. And an important mechanism uh, in, this, uh, in this ability that infants demonstrate is what we call joint attention. Uh, I won't get into the details of this. Uh, it requires a basic theory of mind that infants develop quite early and that robots, a lot of research is ongoing on this for uh, for robots, but I won't focus on this uh, for uh, from in in my work. Uh, the idea is that I'd like to have the agent being able both to understand the intentions of a caregiver of a tutor and uh, later the attention to. So that was for the interaction part, and for the learning part, I. Uh, I choose reinforcement learning quite easily because it was the field, uh, well, one of the most studied fields <coughs> for uh, autonomous learning right now. There is a lot of, uh, of literature on it, but there is a problem in reinforcement learning for my specific use case, which is that it's not goal-directed in itself in the sense that uh, in the reinforcement learning paradigm that you, yeah, that you, that you see on the right, the, the reward comes from the environment. Uh, so uh, it's forced upon the agent and basically once you have designed an environment you have one, re one uh, reward, one goal and the agent has no capability to choose its, uh, its goal inside a typical uh, reinforcement learning algorithm. It's completely forced upon him by, uh, by the environment. So we need to displace the goal origin from the environment to uh, an internal mechanism of the agent. Um, apart from my specific use case, uh, which is for interaction, for interactive agents, uh, having the goal inside the agent, uh, well, having the agent being able to specify a goal for, him, for itself is actually very interesting also for the most generic, the most generic reinforcement learning cases because um, it, has been shown, it has been shown in the last, in the last years that <coughs> reinforcement learning is kind of flowed 
for different reasons. It's difficult for different reasons. A main, the main, well, one of the main one is uh, what we call reward engineering. The idea is that if you don't design your reward properly, you have that kind of behavior because actually it gets a lot of reward doing this just because we specified that we wanted to the agent to go forward. So it does this. It's kind of fun, but it's not the, it's not the, 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 the purpose of, <laughs> of the algorithm. So we are in the case where... Or is it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 it, it, it might be. But. <laughs> well. Uh, so yeah, having... Well, you should mention that this feature comes from a very nice blog from Alex yeah. who provides a very nice criticism of the state of uh, the reinforcement uh, deep reinforcement learning. Yeah. So the idea is that reward engineering is tricky. Sometimes it leads to very intricate rewards to be sure the agent does what you want it to do, and it's not very generalizable in the sense that once you have defined uh, a reward for a specific uh, task, it does not get it's not possible to apply this same reward to another task so it's a bit stupid to have to design rewards for every tasks that you want your agents to be able to uh, accomplish another uh, case for which um, having goals specified by the agent itself is a good idea is for exploration because in environments where the a reward is very sparse, like this infamous Montezuma's game, uh, which is very well known in the Atari benchmark because almost no agent is able to solve it. Uh, the idea is that you don't get any reward before, you, before having done a lot of exploration. And if you are not able to specify sub-goals inside this environment, you will have tremendous difficulties to uh, advance in the, in the environments. So here, this is the kind of environments where having sub-goals and potentially defining sub-goals by yourself as an agent is a good idea to advance more uh, effectively. And finally, it's also the idea of having goals as specified uh, by an internal mechanism, an internal motivation <coughs> system. It's um, a very good start in the line of uh, intrinsic motivate, well, intrinsically motivated agents. Uh, it's, in my opinion, on the question that uh, Sebastian ask, uh, asked uh, earlier, the idea that random goal for me is completely intrinsically motivated because intrinsic <coughs> motivation is just what is uh, on the right. As long as the goal is specified by the agent itself, uh, it's uh, actually the two figures uh, on, from an article uh, you wrote. So uh, this, for me, uh, from the from the moment the goal is specified by G, by the agent itself. It comes from an internal motivation system, so it's intrinsically motivated. Whether or not, then you add curriculum learning or anything. But for it's actually uh, this idea of intrinsic motivations is actually gaining um, gaining credit right now. A lot of people are actually starting to try artificial curiosity with deep reinforcement learning, surprise-based <coughs> reinforcement learning, empowerment-based reinforcement learning. There are a lot of uh, research going on uh, that use old ideas with new algorithms. So uh, that's it for the background. Uh, now a bit about the algorithm that I'm using. I won't spend too much time on the uh, on DDPG because it's like the fifth the fifth time we we are seeing it. So I just remind that remind you that we have a critic Q uh, and an actor mu. Both are okay. <laughs> Both are uh, deep uh, neural networks. And uh, for those of you who would like to reproduce some kinds of results, or I don't know. Uh, you have here the parameters that I use. So sigma is for the exploration. I think um, Cedric mentioned the idea that the exploration in DDPG cr comes from uh, some kind of a very specific noise, and this is the parameters for it, the parameter I use for the noise. Uh, well, other parameters are completely standard in the literature. In the literature, and as for exotic mechanisms that I use and that I'm not sure at all that they are completely necessary, but that I'm used and I don't touch it anymore. Uh, 
uh, is target clipping and gradient inverting. Uh, I think, I don't remember, but I think Olivier mentioned gradient inverting, mentioned both well, in, in your description. Uh, so the most interesting one, in my opinion, is the gradient inverting idea that uh, when your actions are supposed to be bounded, it's quite a good idea when you reach a bound to say, go in the other di direction. Perhaps it's not a b very good idea to, st to stall on the, on the plateau of the, of the actions, actually. So that was for the algorithm. I, I won't go back on this for a while. Most, more importantly, the, the main ingredient of my work uh, right now is what uh, David mentioned, uh, what we call universal value function approximators. So this idea is very, very simple actually. It's the idea that instead, well, you have a value function. In, stada, in standard reinforcement learning, your value <coughs> function is either a function of the state or of the state and the action. That is for the value function, the Q value function. But in universal value function approximators, uh, which we, I will call them UFA from now on, because it's a bit long, uh, the idea is that you add the goal to the state. Uh, you concatenate the state in the initial state and the goal to form an augmented state, uh, which is a goal parameterized state. That's easy as that, and you can choose, uh, you can choose goals in a discrete set of goal, say, of goal states, uh, some goal regions, or more inter interestingly, perhaps a bit closer to what um, IMGEP do. Uh, IMGEPs do the idea that you can choose goal as <coughs> arbitrary re pseudo reward functions. Uh, that's an idea I've not completely explored, but that seems quite interesting. I will perhaps talk about this a bit at the end of the uh, of the of the presentation. So as for the so this uh, idea of UFA comes from a paper that dates back to 2015 by Shaw and uh, actually did not get a lot of traction at this moment at this precise moment because it was published right before the foundational paper on deep reinforcement learning. So at the time this was used and at the time the experiments were carried out. Uh, deep reinforcement learning was not yet a thing. It was not working. We had problem because we didn't use a replay buffer. We didn't use target networks. All the tricks that made it work, that made it work from the DeepMind paper, uh, did, were not used in this paper. So their experiments were very simple, actually. Uh, mainly, they tried to show that uh, if you have four rooms and you sample goals in the three uh, on the on the the up left, up right, and uh, on the bottom left. If you sample goals on these, on these uh, three regions and that you test your, uh, your algorithm on the fourth region, then you have some kind of generalization. Uh, but that stops here, which is a bit sad because actually uh, with the tricks of uh, the deep reinforcement learning literature <laughs> that came after, it would have been, I think, a lot there were a lot more things to do and uh, the ID didn't get any, any traction at this moment exactly. But uh, since last year, so uh, you talked about hindsight experience replay. It's from uh, Andre Kovitz. Uh, it dates back to last year, 2017. And uh, they had this idea that if you take uh, a UFA, so you have your state which is augmented with a goal, um, and if you select a goal, then you perform a rollout of your, uh, with the policy. And it happens that actually you, didn't, you did not achieve the goal that you wished, but instead you achieved a virtual goal uh, that is different. And it's a bit stupid to say that this episode did not teach you anything, because actually it teaches you how to reach the goal uh, you did reach during the episode. And even more, it uh, explains to it teaches you it teaches you how to reach every state that you actually went through during the episode. It's actually very informative as a as a for for the algorithm. And uh, before the with, without UFA, you couldn't use easily this info this information you had in an episode when the goal was not reached. 
So uh, inside experience replay, what they what they propose is to replay entire episodes with a different goal or several different goals. Um, I will go back later on how they select goals, but <coughs> mainly yeah, when you say they, they did random sampling, it was kind of right. Um, so before that, on which, kind of, uh, on which kind of environment they perform uh, their uh, experiments, uh, Cedric mentioned these uh, very new environments. Uh, they they have been released like one month ago. Uh, so it's a seven degree of freedom arm, and they have like four tasks: pushing, sliding, picking, and placing somewhere, and just moving your hand. I think. Um, so which what is m important is how they define the goal and how they define the reward. So the goal is always a desired object positions sampled uh, randomly at the beginning of each episode. Uh, and the reward is binary, so it's quite important actually, I will talk about this later. So instead of having, uh, for example, in continuous Montenka, as Cedric uh, mentioned, you have a reward of 100 when you reach the rightmost goal and a small penalty for acting constantly. Uh, instead, here, what you have is just a reward that is zero when you reach the goal that you set for yourself and minus one in all the other cases. It's the minus one, I, I guess, is just to make sure the, the agent tries to go as quickly as possible to discover the, f the, to discover the, the, the goal. Um, there is a small tolerance epsilon, epsilon to define when you consider that you have reached the goal. Uh, I will perhaps talk about this parameter a bit later uh, if I have time. So here is for the experiments. For the results of the, of the uh, of hindsight experience replay, so well, if I had to well, some to make a summary of it, it's quite efficient on every manipulation task. Uh, what you see here, uh, blue and red are both with hindsight experience replay, while, while um, green and um, and blue and no green and uh, dotted red are standard DDPG with explore with alternative exploration techniques. Uh, so hindsight actually provides a substantial gain. And uh, on this difference between the blue and the red curves, this is what I talked earlier, what I talked about earlier, the idea that um, when you have completed an episode that didn't get you to the goal you wished to, uh, to reach, you have the choice uh, to use a lot of things inside the episode as new goals. All the states that you have visited can be considered as new goals for your uh, hindsight replay uh, mechanism. And these blue and red curves are two separate ways to sample new goals. If I remember well, the red, the red one is by considering that you sample goals from states visited after. So, well, I make it clearer. Uh, when, you, when you replay an episode, for each state of your episode, you sample uh, goals from every state that happened after these states. So it's what they call the future strategy. It's basically saying a goal that could be interesting to learn from is a goal that I did reach after the starting state, the, stati the starting state that I choose. So that's uh, the future strategy. While I think, I don't remember, but I think the blue, the blue curve is for what they call the final strategy, which consists in sampling only one goal by episode, one, only one virtual goal by episode, which is the final one actually reached. It's the most obvious solution, but actually future is uh, shown to work better in most cases. In most cases, it's quite logical. You sample more additional goals and you sample goals that are actually reachable from the state from which you, uh, you, are, su you are sampling them. Yeah, you should specify that this is results from the paper and not your results. Yeah, uh, yeah, I didn't, uh, <laughs> I didn't, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's results from, uh, from the ITAD experience replay paper, uh, and unfortunately not my results. <laughs> yeah. so just uh, one question. Um, 
What does it mean, uh, the curve DDPG? Because as there are goals, and in standard DDPG, you don't specify the goal. Yeah, that so what, what this curve means? Actually, they didn't exp well, they don't say it clearly in the paper, but the guess is um, if they uh, test on multiple goals, they have no other choice than having a version of DDPG that, use, that uses UV UFA, but without hindsight experience replay. So I, my guess, it, they don't say it quite clearly in the paper, in the first paper actually. Mm -hmm. My guess is that these things, uh, these curves for DDPG, are for uh, a version that use UFA, but just with the goal, the basic goal, just by augmenting the state with the goal and specifying the goal at the beginning of the episode and without retraining these with additional goals at the end of the episode. It's a guess, I, because uh, another solution perhaps, but uh, once again, they don't clearly state anything about this, would be to, um, uh, to retrain a DDPG for each, uh, for each goal that they want to test on, uh, on at the end, but I, I, it seems a bit... Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the paper, um, there has been a second version, well, an augmented version of the paper uh, recently from OpenAI where they, that they call uh, ingredients for robotic research, where they actually uh, propose a bit, a, a few questions that how we, how could we um, improve hindsight experience replay. Uh, amongst these questions, these questions you have how many goals and which ones should be virtually created. This is mainly what I will be focusing on uh, on the on my work and on the next slide. Uh, but amongst the questions, a few of them are quite interesting too. Uh, they show in the paper that performances of hindsight experience replay are better when the rewards are sparse. Uh, when you have something like zero when you don't do the task, one when you do, or zero and minus one, depending on the situation. And uh, this reward seems to be better than shaped ones, uh, meaning like if your goal is uh, at the given distance of, what of your state, then you get a reward proportional to this, proportional to this distance. And it seems that inset experience replay doesn't work that well when the rewards that are used are shaped and they don't give any satisfactory explanation in my opinion in both papers. It seems to be quite a good question to, to ask them also if they have something they didn't say in the paper for example. Um, another question but I will com come back to, um, to this later is the last one. How to deal with environments where there is no obvious goal distributions so all the environments they carried out experiments on are like manipulation environments and it's quite obvious that the goal state is the space, is the Euclidean space and it's very easy to sample from this. But for example, if we go back to the half cheetah case, it's, it becomes quite difficult to say what do we sample as goals and that's why, uh, that's why uh, Cedric, for example, say the minimum over the episode could be a, an interesting thing, the average um, speed over the episode could be an interesting thing, but there are environments where it's absolutely not obvious, obvious to sample goals. And finally, I forget the last, the third question. So, uh, from this existing work, my objective will be to study the properties of goal parameterization with UFA uh, in continuous control environments. And uh, especially, I am trying to do what you mentioned earlier in the discussion, which is explore a way to sample goals more intelligently that randomly or randomly in the future, uh, which is not very advanced, uh, not a very advanced mechanism either. Uh, the idea would be to explore competence-based goal selection mechanism. I will explain that uh, right now. And with and without hindsight experience replay to see whether selecting goals intelligently is enough to boost performances, uh, whether hindsight experience replay can benefit from this intelligent selection of goals and so on. There are a lot of questions uh, on this. 
So uh, I'm not going back on the environment continuous mountain curve because it was already presented by um, by Cedric. The idea is that for a, it's a very simple example of an environment where I add the a goal. The goal is now the target position on the x-axis. So so but that's why I uh, drew <coughs> a lot of uh, flags on the. Uh, you can set any goal in the environment. Uh, the figure is very dark, but uh, another environment on which I will try, it's what I call a Tor environment, it's, it's from the OpenAI gym suit also. It's the, the environment reacher when you have a two degree of freedom arm. Uh, and in this case, the, state, the initial state of the environment is uh, the components are angular positions, angular velocities, and the position uh, of the extremity of the arm, and in UFA, you had you add the mm, the target x y position inside the arena, and uh, this why for the toy environments to show things quite easily because they are in two dimension or one on two dimension, so it's very easy to have visualization visualizations. Uh, and for the next step, I wanted to have a suit of environments of increasing complexities. So once again, the figures are quite dark, but I modified environments from uh, the DeepMind control suit that is quite recent too, where you have um, an arm that is quite similar to the one uh, in terms of degree of freedom. It's quite the same as the fetch robotic arms of the OpenAI new suit. I didn't know about it when I designed this. Um, so the idea is that you have a very simple version of the arm, which is which purpose is just to reach any position in the in the environment, and then I add complexities uh, in this environment, with first a ball on the second one, a ball and a cup. The purpose of the environment being to pick the ball and put it in the cup. I can do the same with instead of a ball uh, using some kind of key. They call it they call it a peg in the in the DeepMind control suit. And from the key, you can have a slot. So the purpose of the environment is to take the key and place it properly inside the slot. And finally, you have uh, the case where uh, instead of ball or keys, you have blocks that you, for, ex for example, that you want to stack. So these make uh, some kind of suit of environments <laughs> with varying difficulties. So now for the results, so as I said, there are preliminary preliminary results, there will, there will not be any results on this DeepMind modified control suit uh, for now. Um, amongst the messages that were quite clear during the first experiments, uh, there is this idea that when you train on random goals, that when you see a lot of goals during training, the performance on a single goal is a lot more stable, a lot more robust. So what you, what you see here, in green is the performance of DDPG, the standard version of DDPG over 20 runs and you, on a continuous mountain car. So you see that even if there seems to be a lot of runs that reached a good uh, performance, there st are still at the end of the training a lot of uh, runs that, well, didn't, didn't do actually anything interesting. <laughs> Uh, on the contrary, when you train on a lot of goals inside the continuous mountain car environment, what you see is first it goes, it um, it rises a lot uh, a bit earlier. But overall, what is more uh, what is more important is that uh, the results are not variable. And when you have learned something, you well, it's consistent over uh, across the different runs. So this is quite a good thing from the uh, point of view of um, reproducibility, for example. Uh, also, something which is, uh, with hindsight, quite obvious, uh, the fact that training on multiple goals allow to reach any point in the environment at test time. So even if you uh, don't see every goal, because you can't sample every goal during training time, you will be able to generalize and learn how to reach any goal in the environment uh, at this time. So what you see here, are, um, the blue curve is uh, when you don't train with you don't train with goal parameterization, but you test on 
a batch of randomly sampled goals. And the other two curves are when you train with goal parameterization that well, you, you use uh, UFAS <coughs> and you test on randomly sampled goals. So it's quite obvious that uh, in one case you learn, in one case you learn to generalize, in the other case you don't. Uh, actually, a qu an interesting question that I will mention again uh, uh, later is um, training on multiple goals allowed to reach any point, perhaps, but what is the minimum number of goals we need to train on to reach any uh, goal in the, in, the, in the state space at test time? So that is a question that, uh, that could be interesting to, to study. So now, it's a bit sad that the images are very blurred. So um, what, I, uh, what I measured also is uh, the evolution of, competen of competence all along the, the training. <laughs> so what I define as competence in my environment, in my agent, is uh, based on the Q values. So I say that the, comp the competence for a goal G is the Q value from the starting position in the environment uh, for this goal and by using the action associated to this, uh, to this couple start goal. So this is my first try at evaluating competence in a deep reinforcement learning algorithm. I am actually open to any suggestion as how I could do it differently because it seems not optimal. And what you observe here in the, in the image is a heat map of the evolution of the competence for goals along the x-axis of the continuous mountain car environment. So be careful because the x-axis of the environment is represented on the y-axis of the figure. And on the x-axis of the figure, you have the training steps. So what you see here that is that uh, when the agent starts at, at its initial position in the environment, its competence is widening at the very beginning because it can, it can reach very easily a lot of positions around its, its initial state. But it's not very clear on, the, um, on here, but actually there is a plateau here uh, because there, uh, to reach further, uh, further on the right positions, uh, you need to understand that you have to go on the left before and then to go on the right. And this is why the competence stalls a bit here, because it takes time, it takes a lot of exploration to understand that. And uh, an idea for sampling goals would be to use its competence and especially to use competence progress. So the idea that you can see easily the zones on uh, the lines on the, uh, on the competence heat map that Tell, that tells you where if, well, if you sample here, there are chances that you make progress. So the idea of this is to take a, take a kind of uh, temporal derivative of this heat map and use it as um, a mechanism to prioritize some goals. So uh, prioritized sampling, uh, these results are very preliminary preliminary and to be taken care of, well, well, take care, uh, well, don't believe them, uh, because actually uh, they were not true across all experiments. Uh, the idea is that on this specific case, uh, I did have some benefit from competence progress based goal selection mechanisms. Uh, it's always on the continuous mountain care environment, so you see that um, the red curves the red curve is without uh, competence progress based goal selection, while the blue, yellow, no, the green, yellow, and purple curves are in order with an increasing amount of proportional sampling. And when I say proportional sampling, what I mean is that I uh, give more importance to, goal, to goals that uh, are in zones of high competence progress. That's what I call a proportional sampling. And what you see is that with, in this very specific case, with a bit of proportional sampling, you have better results, but with too much of it, you have worse results. Once again, these do not generalize well to any environments and even to any run of this experiment. Um, so uh, on the heat map I showed you earlier, what was not very clear on, the, on here, but was clear on my, uh, on my screen is that it's a very noisy evaluation of, um, 
of the competence and to, uh, to correct, to fix this, I decided to use the SAG uh, RAAC algorithm. So uh, I, try, I will try not to get into the details of this, but the idea is that when you have a goal space, uh, there are regions in this goal space where the competence vary, varies differently. Uh, and what you want to do is to have inside these regions uh, to be able to compute a temporal average of uh, the evolution of competence. So you sample regularly uh, the competence on this, on inside these regions and you take, the idea is to take the difference of the average on the right minus, uh, you take the average on the right minus the average on the left and that gives you a form of, of temporal averaging of um, of the competence. So here is what it gives on, uh, on continuous mountain care. So at the very beginning, 0 0.5 on the, on the colors mean that there is no competence progress and 0 means it just even not initialized. Though for, for now there is nothing to observe. It's just acquiring experiences before being able to compute com com competence progress. And you will see the moment where it understand things, if it's now. So here you have enough experiment, uh, enough experience to understand that the starting zone is actually where you are making the most progress right now because it's very easy to reach. So your your Q values are learning very quickly on this on this zone. And on the other hand, um, the regions of the continuous mountain care environment where you cannot, that you cannot reach in one big step uh, are considered more difficult. So it's uh, quite, it seems to be uh, functional in this case. And if I, if I leave it, uh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> okay. So, but the, the idea is that it seems to be, um, we can use this measure and it seems to actually uh, perform temporal av averaging on, um, on the competence calculations. The remaining work, so um, I tried to combine hindsight experience replay and goal uh, competence based goal sampling. It did not give anything very convincing. Uh, basically here um, the results with hindsight are worse than without, but I suspect, uh, I suspect it's due to the fact that the continuous mountain care environment is very particular in the sense that um, the best course of actions to solve the environment is to uh, do minus one, one, uh, that, is to, that is to go on the left then go on the right. And this is very specific case where uh, the course of actions only contains extreme actions. So exploration in this case is very, very important and uh, the best results I had on this environment was to use a lot of exploration and nothing else. So I think the continuous mountain car is not completely well suited to, um, to uh, perform uh, goal exploration and uh, overall hindsight experience replay, but it's uh, I'm actually learn launching experiments on Reacher and the DeepMind control suits environments for this. Another thing that is uh, a good direction would be the automatic region discovery. What I did not, what I did not mention in the little video I just showed uh, is the fact that the eight regions of the continuous mountain care environment, I gave the agent these regions. Uh, it did not discover uh, these regions by itself. Uh, instead, we it would be a good idea if the agent could um, divide the initial goal space into different regions of different computation, com well, of different competence progress uh, with different competence progress measures. And this is exactly what the complete SAG RIAC uh, splitting mechanism does. Uh, so splitting the goal space into subspaces by trying to maximize uh, to discriminate as, as, well, as well as possible areas according to the levels of competence progress. Uh, so for example, 
if you have an environment that is a rectangle and you have inside this rectangle uh, six subregions in which the competence evolves like the different plots here. So for example, on here you see that it's very easy to uh, reach a competence of one on this uh, bottom left uh, subregions, while it's more difficult on the on the top right. Well, if you have that kind of uh, configuration of an envi of environment, you would like the agent to be able to uh, learn to separate them properly. And hmm, why doesn't it work? Anyway. Well. It's being a bit messy. I don't know why. <laughs> well, uh, for an unknown reason, the <laughs> the video got uh, rotated. So, actually, what you see is uh, you have to. Oh no, no, it's working properly. Okay, I didn't say anything. Uh, you have this separation, so the algorithm is splitting the regions uh, into subregions as it discovers that uh, inside subregions the competence evolves differently. And so you will see that uh, in, this in this specific case, the parameters of the splitting mechanism seem to be not tuned enough to discover the exact six regions. It's quite difficult to, to fall right onto the six proper regions, but you see that um, it will uh, more or less discover uh, the good sep a good separation of results with um, a big separation on the middle. Here, very quickly, it understand that, uh, and here at the convergence, so it's well, it went very fast. <laughs> so if I explain, well, that's a good uh, that's a good start. So in the in the bottom region, you had. Three subregions where competence was evolving quite fast, so the algorithm solved them quite fast also. And after a certain amount of steps, there is no difference in competence because each of these subregions have been solved. So the, the algorithm understands that and say there is no need to separate these in subregions anymore. So you see that it has become a big region, while on the top of the image, uh, the subregions are still to be separated because there are still differences in the speed at which they, uh, they are learned. And that's why you have still the separation. And if, yep, and you see that at the end it's the rightmost uh, in the, on the top that is still considered a subregion. Uh, as I said earlier, the idea that um, what to do when you don't have any uh, and you don't have any um, obvious goal distribution, uh, a very interesting uh, path for me is the use of interaction to specify these kind of, uh, of regions that would be interesting or a very uh, original work from uh, Cristiano, Deep Reinforcement Learning from Human Preferences, where they teach uh, an agent in New Joko to perform backflips by just saying when between two samples, between two episodes of the agents, which one was closer to the backflip. So you show a lot of, um, of pairs of episodes to humans and they tell the agent, this one got better, this one got better, and at the end you have something oh. you have something like that. So it's quite impressive because this is typically a very hard to specify uh, reward or goal. So uh, I think <coughs> this is an interesting path to follow. And finally, a few questions for, uh, for all of you. Uh, one I did already mention, the idea that how should I compute the competence uh, for goals inside a reinforcement learning agent. For now, I use the Q values, but it's not that obvious. And also, 
how do I take care of cases where the competence of my agent uh, depends on variable things in the state space. For example, in, in my manipulator environments where you have balls, blocks and so on, there are configurations of the objects in the environment that make some problem difficult, more difficult than they were initially. So how do I, do I understand that some configurations of my environment are worse or better than others for, my compete, for computing my competence? Um, another question I already mentioned, the optimal goal number to be used uh, to generalize completely to, uh, to the whole state space during test time. And uh, finally, another idea which is, should I understand during training uh, which part of the state space are unreachable, which ones are reachable? So the answer is yes, it would be better if I could, but it's already complicated enough. So uh, for now, I don't do it. Um, but it's kind of inter it's quite interesting to uh, try to find regions not to explore if you understand that they, it's, it's of no use. So thank you for your attention. Um, so thanks very much for those explanations. So um, maybe a first uh, a small question about your last slide. Yep. Um, your last point is a bit bizarre to me, uh, in the sense that I think Sagariete uh, does. Work. Its main adver its I mean the the, the the environment in which it is most obviously useful are environments with unreachable uh, parts. Yeah. Uh, it typically where indeed it's difficult to specify the goal space in a way that is uh, like like the engineer might know what kind of features are useful to define goals but for example the engineers might not know which combinations are reachable which ones are not and I would say that SAGRSA in practice is the mm. most efficient in those cases because okay. it will uh, basically rule out those parts where there is no learning progress which are either the <coughs> non-reachable one mm. or the trivial one okay. Well, so, the, so I'm not so sure why you... No, well, actually the question was, um, at the same time, does Sagiri Acid does this, which you answered, and the question was also, what is most interesting to uh, study from the research point of view, whether we are better at training or whether we are able to discover reachable versus unreachable uh, parts of the state. I think it's two completely interesting questions, but just which one should be addressed first. But, but actually, so related to this, uh, so then before you presented experiments like uh, using uh, this kind of um, uh, the competence-based uh, choice of goals, but uh, in the um, in the Earth framework, uh, <coughs> right? Yeah. Um, but so in, in in the environment that you use, like uh, mountain car, actually the the way the goal space, or even in uh, Alcita the way the goal space is designed is that actually uh, most goals, I would say, or even all goals are reachable. Yep. Maybe th they are more or less difficult, but they are uh, all, all reachable. Uh, and so that, that is not the kind of uh, environment mm. where uh, it's easiest to expect a big impact. Yep. Uh, that, maybe yeah. you can find some impact, but... That's why I, a bit, it's a bit a part of the reason I designed these environments because uh, when you have an object in which you try to insert something, it's clear that there are parts, well, there are configurations where you can't do uh, the, uh, when well, you can't insert the key if you try to go. Uh, this adds a bit of complexity in this sense, but it's, it's true that it's not, um, perhaps not enough or perhaps too complicated for a start also because uh, it would be very much much simpler to have a richer environment where you have an, uh, an arm and just extend the goal space to uh, larger than what the arm call can reach. And in this case, it would discover that uh, it can reach the reachable part for the arm. It would be simpler in this case. But actually, in, in that ca even that case, is uh, the random choice of goal is already pretty efficient. Okay. Um, I think it, 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 yep. it, it, it becomes inefficient Typically in cases like uh, in the setups uh, that uh, Sebastian <coughs> presented, but I think also these ones, mm -hmm. where typically you have multiple objects to interact with, and uh, and so here there is a combinatorial explosion of uh, combination of things you could imagine you could do with objects, but but uh, but most of them are uh, not meaningful. But mm. you don't know initially. Yeah. 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 Y
So, I mean, but what is your idea of using this set of suits? Is it like using each task independently, or actually it's yeah. like a, oh. just one? Uh, there is there, uh, there is one uh, environment that I didn't show on the slide, which I call the playroom, which is inspired from the playroom experiment. Uh, well, I place everything in the environment, and the ultimate goal of my work would be to leave the agent, try to learn everything it can in such an environment, and show that it's taught by learning how to move. It's actually reproducing the work of Sebastian in, uh, with complete deep reinforcement learning algorithms. Uh, try to first move the hand, then grasp objects, and so on. So there is a version of, this envir of these environments uh, where you have... Actually, in between, uh, you could imagine like using those different environments, but in a single experiment, where uh, you try and uh, you test you, it, you, you train on one. You, you act, uh, when you choose a goal, actually, you select one of these uh, tasks families. A bit yeah. like you, you choose a room, uh, like for example, mm -hmm. the experiment that uh, David was are talking, where you have a robot moving into rooms. Here, you have several rooms, and in each room, you have uh, okay, yeah. uh, different games. But the choice of the room is part of the parameter. And so maybe here you could have a, a, a few tasks that are a bit like distractors. Uh, okay. Uh, where many, maybe you can imagine many goals, but uh, most of them uh, mm. don't give anything. So, for example, it's a typical case where you would not want to sample very often those. Uh, okay, yeah. I was, I was thinking of training on a, sub and a subset of these environments and testing of the remaining ones, but it's related, okay. Yeah. Any other question? Yes. Task, uh, yep. and pushing objects. Uh, what is the action space? Um, uh, the action space, well, in all the environments where you have an arm, uh, the action space is uh, in the, um, is the, um, the torques of the, uh, the joints. Uh, we, well, it's a good question because <coughs> something I did not mention in the hindsight experience replay paper and something I didn't see when I read it first is the fact that their action space is not the same as, as mine. Uh, their action space is uh, they are controlling their, uh, their arms in positions while I'm controlling them in, uh, in force. In, uh, and thus their action space are actually the positions uh, they just um, choose to go and use the inverse model of Mujoko to uh, go to the position. In, uh, I, I guess it's easier with the put well in the when you use as actions the positions in the environment because you don't have to learn the dynamics actually of the uh, of the of the musical environment which is for me a lot in in deep reinforcement learning but well i didn't do this in my in my environment it's quite easily changeable too. and it's also part of the mystery of of uh, i mean like well, coming back to the R uh, benchmark you, you said that they show that when they use dense mm -hmm. words, the, the results are worse. And so one of, when I asked you uh, whether there was an explanation, you suggested the hypothesis that maybe it's because when you have dense rewards, there might be more deceptive, uh, more deceptive landscape. But actually, after this, I discovered that their action space is directly the, uh, yeah. the ineffector. And, so and it I makes, cannot see how it makes it no sense. Yet. So it's really strange, this result. Um, yeah, uh, when I answered you, I didn't know uh, yet that uh, their action yeah, space yeah, was. Uh, um, uh, well, I don't know. Just yes. Precision. Can you come back to the competence slide? Uh, 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 yes. yes. I don't remember this one, for example. I'm not sure I understand completely what you say. Is the Q function is your estimation of the Q function, or is it like uh, you resample? Uh, what I what I do well the Q the Q here is the Q value inside the algorithm. It's a self estimation of the own computer by the agent. No, no, it's the Q value of the agents. It's not actually the Q exists before I try to compute anything like competence. It's just the Q value inside the actor critic uh, inside the actor critic of the DDPG algorithm. Yeah, it's the critic. Yeah, it's the, it's the critic, and that's why it um, it's not obvious as to why I did use that. It just came at the most obvious possibility. But mm, and what I do is that uh, I 
regularly I resample for each for uh, for example I had 100 goals here for which I resampled uh, regularly uh, this the, these values with the with the critic with, with the critic of the of the algorithm you could also maybe use this starting uh, this sample as starting point then actually simulate to a simulation using the reactor and oh yeah like a Monte Carlo yeah well, uh, well, actually, yeah, ex that's a good idea. That would be more stable. Yeah, more probably. Stable, less accessible to believe. Yeah, well, the advantage of this is that it's instantaneous to have this value also, because, well, we already have it. So a point related to that. So indeed, as you said, um, a challenge uh, is that, OK, actually, uh, what you want to use is a measure of uh, competence progress, so the derivative of the competence. Um, and you want to explore in in space in part of the goal space where the derivative is uh, uh, is maximal. But actually, what you want to do is not explore in the goal space where the deri the derivative in the short past is maximum, but where the, the expected deri deri derivative yeah. in the future will be maximal. And so, the typical uh, uh, filtering that you've been using and that we've been using many times is a very naive one, uh, which is. Um, uh, you take, uh, you filter the, this noise by taking a, a sliding window in the past, and you you uh, you, you compute the derivative by basically averaging uh, overlapping windows. Uh, and then what it means is that in a way you are implicitly, we, well, we are implicitly making um, a model of the derivative function as a constant function, uh, and in environment which are uh, where well, you need to learn fast. Yeah. Uh, this can be a problem because uh, when you have eva at the point where you have a good estimate of learning progress it's too late to explore because you've already done the learning and so something that we've not explored that, that, that would be very interesting is instead of modeling the derivative as a constant function to actually make regression on the derivative like linear regression or non-linear regression so for example you could um, uh, uh, fil filter the, the, the the past, uh, well, you use this actually the past of, comp of measures of mm -hmm. competence in local areas, and for example, you could use a Gaussian process to, to measure the evolution, and then you would use the, de the derivative uh, of uh, mm -hmm. that, that, that is given by the Gaussian process yeah. in the future. But it, it's it's making so. assumption of the evolution of the competence in the environment, and we don't know it, so. No, but you, you have the data. So, for example, you could, have oh, okay. mm. you, you could have a competence value, for example, which is, uh, uh, for example, evolving like this. So you could yeah. see, for example, by looking at the second derivative, that maybe the derivative is currently high, but it is slowing down okay. very fast, and as opposed to another part of the space where it's actually uh, increasing. Okay. And, and it could make the algorithm potentially uh, much more reactive. But we didn't try yeah. at all, but I think well, it's the thing, uh, well, uh, the idea of, for example, taking the second derivative to anticipate the changes of competence progress is good, but it's, I, it would be very noisy, I think, it, a lot more than the first derivative. Uh, I'm uh, not sure, because the, the idea would be that you really use um, uh, a regression method. Yeah, if, you, if uh, your regression is smooth enough, then yeah. okay. I mean, already linear regression mm. would probably be more reactive than, uh, because here it's, it's like very... Uh, it's it's very good for filtering here, but it's maybe too much filtering in the sense that it's uh, mm. uh, putting a lot of inertia in the, in the system. Um, just one thing regarding when you said um, uh, that it was the expected competence progress that was interesting for from the reinforcement learning point of view. There is an old paper by Sutton and uh, I don't remember the name of the other guy. Too bad for him. Uh, where uh, their Markov decision uh, process is the the state of the Markov decision process is the policy uh, inside the Markov decision process of the environment, and so they do some meta RL and they show that in this Markov decision process where the policy is the state, uh, the value function are actually well the um, the TD error is close to the progress in expected uh, in com well the progress in competence and uh, but it's clearly intractable in every uh, state space because the state of uh, the the set the state of the space of policies is huge very quickly but i find the idea interesting uh, from the competence progress uh, point of view yes have you tried the monte 
Suma no. <laughs> now, the thing with uh, my uh, in, with this work is that it could be uh, applied to uh, discrete actions uh, cases like Montezuma's. But for now, I have not uh, I have not tried any uh, any games. For example, the Atari games. I've not tried any of them for two reasons. Because first, I'm not using uh, discrete. Uh, discrete uh, action uh, environments, and also because uh, I don't have the computational power to uh, play with uh, games, with video games. It's just too cost, well, too much, uh, too long for me to train on with convolutional network. So I try to avoid that as long as I can. Yep. Sorry, I didn't. Uh, Atari games yeah. uh, you don't have to use convolutional networks, you don't have to look at them. Yeah, I discovered that actually you can, you could have a, sta a reduced say, state space. Okay, and for example, I don't know what would be the state space for a game like Moonfall. Image. Uh, sorry, the memory ma the Okay, image. okay. But it's quite huge in, no? It's relatively small footprint. It's, uh, okay. I don't know the size right now, but it's like significantly smaller. Okay. Than well, it could be. A, it could be actually a, the all these all the works that I presented on uh, sampling goals is completely. It's completely possible to apply it to discrete case. So yeah, I could try. I could try. Uh, I could try on the Atari. Uh, for me, it was natural. Well, it was natural to try with convolutional things, but uh, I want to avoid that. At, uh, but you know, you're in the robotics lab. Yeah. Also, <laughs> there is that. <laughs> <laughs> the geometry of these spaces is probably uh, not so nice as uh, yeah. the position. So. In yeah, also there is that, yeah. It would be perhaps uh, best suited for a case where we want to discover the goal space rather than setting it in advance. Um. Okay. <laughs>